I will um, begin this morning with a personal reflection that today is Debbie's and my 52nd wedding anniversary. And I am thankful for that. It's not to be taken for granted. The most splendid, most loving people don't necessarily get this. It's a gift. Anyone who gets there knows this. It's a gift to be humbly received. I'm simply grateful to God and thankful to Debbie for indulging my often preoccupied ways. Amen. <laughs> and you wonder why I'm preoccupied. <laughs> and who with. <laughs> and happy Thanksgiving to all of you with a special welcome to those visiting with us this morning. This is a great time of the year. I hope you all had a splendid day on Thursday. I also hope you survived uh, Black Friday and were not too badly damaged by it. Black Friday, what a concept. What a window into the soul of a culture. Like, gracious God, we're really thankful, but, but we want a whole lot more stuff, you know. So Friday morning in the New York Times, I read of a man in... New Hampshire, Jeffrey Holt, who died this year and whose will revealed a big secret. He had $3.8 million, and he was leaving it all to the town of Hinsdale, where he had been quietly living in a trailer park with a friend. He just didn't care about stuff. Next week starts... Advent, the most wonderful season, most wonderful of all seasons. Advent comes from a Latin root meaning coming, and so the season of Advent is an invitation to inward preparedness, calling us to listen and to prepare our hearts for the coming of Jesus. And truly Jesus comes to us and to our friends, and to our neighbors, and to everyone, to be born anew, again and again. This is the sacred truth that is at the heart of the Advent and then Christmas season. In these glorious weeks, may he be reborn in you and in me, in our land, in Israel, and Palestine, in Ukraine, and Russia, wherever people are suffering this year. But this morning we come to the end of our series on the Spirit of God, and it's been an important series and one to build on. In many ways, my life is the story of a soul opening up to the Spirit of God, of my growing in consciousness that I live, that we live, in a world lit by resurrection and open to the Spirit of God. There are times now when I go out on prayer walks and I meditate on some episode from the life of Christ, say the transfiguration, and I picture it. And I picture it slowly and deeply and sometimes, unimaginable as this once was to me, I'm inside the story. And it's like the heavens open, and I'm immersed in the Spirit of God, awash in the Spirit of God, feeling surges of energy flowing down my spine and down my arms. And I know what Scripture means when it speaks of Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. And I've come to realize how unfortunate it is that terms like this confuse people, baptism with the Holy Spirit. Indeed, one of the great scandals of church history 
is that terms like these have been weaponized into debating points and into marks of division. But over the years, I've come to see the Bible in ways both simpler and more profound. And I now believe that baptism with the Holy Spirit refers to a simple yet profound spiritual experience that many, many people have had, a good number of whom don't know it yet. Some of us, maybe you, maybe many of us. And now we come to Paul writing to the Ephesian Christians to be filled with the Spirit in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. This is the conclusion of the matter. Be filled with the Spirit of God. Take this to the max. Be filled with the wild, untamed, unpredictable Spirit of God. Beyond category, beyond formula, often beyond words, as Morgan Prophet Davis led us through just a few weeks ago. Beyond expectations. It shows, it's, it's how believers, it's how believers are described again and again in the book of Acts. Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit. Whole gatherings of believers were filled with the Holy Spirit. And in fact, earlier in the Ephesian letter, Paul prays that the Ephesian believers will be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Ephesians chapter 2, or chapter 3, verse 19. Mark that passage, star it. That sounds like not a little filled, but way filled. Filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Paul is saying, and he says this very directly in that next verse, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, that you can't imagine the power that is at work in you. It can do immeasurably more than all that we ask or imagine. So be filled with the Spirit. It's an amazing text, and it bears a close look. Now, the first thing we must realize is that it's not for our own glorification. It's done to empower us to serve and to change the world. It's all part, Paul has already said in the Ephesian letter, of bringing all things in heaven and on earth together under Christ. Paul says that in chapter 1, verse 10, that this is and always has been God's intent, God's plan. Certainly, taking care of inner city children, like Shiloh does, comes to mind. Or the children of Haiti, like Hope for Haiti's children does. Or interfaith work here in Stanford, or reaching out to beleaguered immigrants far from the homes they have always known, or bringing an end to prejudice and discrimination, to fear-mongering, wherever it may happen. But bringing all things in heaven and on earth together under Christ is the real story on planet Earth. Paul develops this theme in the book of Ephesians in chapters 1 to 3 and then in chapters 4 to 6. He tells his readers how to do it, the part that they must play in all this. And he says in chapter 5, verse 18, if you're going to do this, do not get drunk on wine. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now notice what Paul is saying here. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now Paul is saying is you are going to be filled with something some hunger or some craving, something. And Paul, again, going back to something he's already said earlier in Ephesians, he's going back there and he's talking about the insatiability of sin. 
in chapter 4, verses 17 to 19, the hungriness of sin, the way we are never satisfied by sin. Have you noticed that? The way we're never satisfied by sin, that darkened life with its continual lust for more. There's a hole in our souls, in your soul and mine, and one way or another, we're going to try something to fill it. We're going to work harder, buy more, or drug ourselves, maybe drink a lot, or try sex, or maybe just get lost in some fantasy. But we're going to do something and none of it will work. None of it will fill us up except to be filled with the Spirit. Because the hole inside our souls is God-shaped, and only God can fill it. It's the creature longing for its creator. It's the child longing for its parents. It's the traveler longing for home. It's experienced as discontent or restlessness, and, and you may think that you need a new wife, or a new husband, or a new job, or, or just a boost to get you going in the morning, or just something to relax in the evening, but that's not it. And no therapy, no drugs, nothing will rid you of the whole because you were made that way. Do not get drunk on anything. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Until God fills the hole, you will be empty. Maybe forever. It's our homesickness for heaven. Our longing for God. And the only answer is to be filled with the Spirit of God. And if we are not filled with the Spirit of God, some other hunger will drive and control us and lead us to places we should never go and to decisions we should never make over and over again. It's urgently important, essentially essential to really living, that we be filled with the Spirit, and Paul, beginning in verse 19, tells us how. And he says it takes three things. First, he says in, first, in verse 19, be filled with the Spirit by speaking to one another in Psalms, the early Christian hymn book, to speaking to one another with Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, I could try to distinguish the three, but that wasn't Paul's point. I could note the speaking to one another component in song, the antiphonal or responsive nature, likely, of early Christian music, but Paul's point and what matters is singing, making music in your heart to the Lord. These, the songs that Eddie leads us in each Sunday in worship, are the songs of our lives. These are the songs of our lives, not the one, ones on the Billboard Hot 100. These are what we hum or sing under our breath or sing to the heavens. Because these are the songs that bring us life. When we are troubled, or when I am troubled, or tempted, or tested, sweet will of God, still fold me closer till I am wholly lost in thee. These songs, these songs are not about love gone wrong, but about love gone very right. And when these songs are in our heart, we are being filled with the Spirit, and something begins to happen in the deep structures of our souls and personalities. Second, Paul says in verse 20, be filled with the Spirit by always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and not just on this weekend. We thank God for the food, yes, Instead of worrying about the car repair, we thank God that we've ever had a car. Instead of worrying about the house, 
we thank God for the host. Instead of fearing disease, we thank God for health. Instead of fearing death, we thank God for the forever life we already have in God. We thank God even for the things that first distress us, because we know that God creates work out of even the most unpromising of situations. But often we pray like the little boy who was going upstairs for his goodnight prayers and stopped in the doorway and shouted, I'm going upstairs to pray. Anyone want anything? Instead of, uh, instead of Father, gimme, 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 I want, I just want. We might do better to pray, gracious God, God of astonishing love and generosity, I thank you, I praise you, I adore you, I'm grateful to you, I serve you, I love you, I celebrate you, I honor you. And praying like that, we become filled with the Spirit. Third, Paul says in verse 21, be filled with the Spirit by submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Text goes on to describe the responsibilities of wives and husbands in chapter 5, verses 22 to 33, and the responsibilities of children and fathers and of slaves and masters on into chapter 6 expressed particularly in the light of first century culture. Don't miss that. And it's those verses, especially the ones addressed to wives, that we have over the centuries most often singled out and quoted. But these verses are only illustrating a larger principle that the way to be filled with the Spirit is by submitting to one another out of reverence for Jesus. Paul is saying to be filled with the Spirit, cultivate in yourself this quality that submits to one another. We quit insisting on our own way. We quit forcing things. We listen to one another. We seek really to understand one another. We're always open to the wisdom of one another. And when you do this, nothing less than the Spirit of God fills you, and redemptive healing change begins to happen in the deep structures of one's soul and personality. And at long last, you're filled. At long last, filled. How is the hole in your soul filled? It's filled not by working harder or buying more or drinking a lot or a pick-me-up in the morning to get you going or having sex, but by the Spirit of God who, can, who can, alone can fill the God-shaped hole in your soul. And now you can get on with God's task of bringing all things in heaven and on earth together under Christ so that there will be no more October 7ths, no more Sabbath mornings of horror in Israel, no more bombs falling on Gaza, no more ruthless, maniacal dictators or wannabe dictators, no more restless hate, no more children deprived of their parents through either divorce or poverty or inattentiveness. No more communities torn apart by crime and prejudice and discrimination. The question this morning is, are you filled with the Spirit? Are you filled with the Spirit? Do you, do you sing and make music in your heart to the Lord? Are you always thanking God? Have you learned to want to appreciate what you have and to find the beauty in everyday life, in a child's smile, 
in the sky at sunset or as the sun comes up over the Connecticut hills. In the gentle wisdom of a friend, in the color of autumn, in the wonder of Advent, do you hear the music of the universe everywhere you go? Do you find satisfaction in the company of people all around you? Do you see in ordinary things and minds and lives the sacred? Have you learned the wisdom that comes from submitting to one another? The wisdom that comes not from seeking how you might better teach one another, but rather what you might learn from one another. The call this morning is to be filled with the Spirit, to be at long last filled. To quit seeking to be filled by work or money or drink or drugs or anything but the Spirit of God. Amen. To have those transforming moments when you are so overcome with the Spirit of God that it's like an electrical flow, liquid fire, an intense penetrating warmth surging through you, a force field you've never felt before. To be intoxicated with God, carried away, exhilarated, energized by God, full of God's life in you, awash in the Spirit of God immersed in the Spirit of God, baptized with the Spirit of God. Now perhaps in this Thanksgiving season or in the season of Advent, it's up to us to enter fully into a world lit by resurrection and open to the Spirit of God. If not now, when? Why would anyone wait on that? And yes, it begins in Christian baptism, and nothing could embody or reenact this better than baptism, but that's only the beginning. Then when we fully enter this world, body and soul, without reservations, so that I wake up in it every morning, every morning filled with the Spirit, mindful of the Spirit of God, life becomes entirely new. It becomes what Scripture's calls newness, newness of life. Have you got that? This newness of life? You can. You can experience the sheer joy of being alive and alive forever. You can be energized just by trusting God. You can live vibrantly, increasingly, fearlessly. And so much more is possible in your life and in the lives of those that you love than you have ever, ever imagined. 